Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am, as always, your host, Jack Smart, the awards editor at Backstage, your guide to the acting industry and the most trusted name in casting. We're here to give you a front row seat to the small screen's biggest awards race, the 2017 Emmy Awards. This season of In the Envelope is brought to you by HBO. Hi, Jamie. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to this final episode. Ah, are you excited for our final episode? I am. I am as well. It's bittersweet, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, but going out on a high. Oh, we certainly are. We have two of the biggest guests that we've had on our podcast today, which, uh, as listeners can guess, based on the title of this episode, we have Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Anthony Anderson on the podcast today. (laughs) <laughs> Two of your favorite shows, isn't it? Veep and Blackish. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And many people's favorite shows. Yeah, um, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, as everyone knows, is reigning queen of TV comedy. You know, Emmy winner over the last five years. She's got a total of nine Emmys. I can't believe she joined us yeah. on our little podcast. She is a master. She's a master of nuance. She gives a master class in comedic acting in every episode. Sometimes she gives a master class in dramatic acting. Yeah. And she's done that in, in plenty of her roles. And many people know her from Seinfeld. Many people know her from The New Adventures of Old Christine, from her many, many films. And who doesn't watch Veep? Yeah. Right? Only losers. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Only <laughs> losers. <laughs> it's interesting because it's become a bit of a fantasy escapist kind of show when <laughs> isn't that interesting <laughs> yeah. it started out as a satire <laughs> <laughs> yep and this most recent season was of course uh planned and written and, and shot and everything before the 2016 presidential election but it as you say it's escapist because it presents this alternative reality that's both uncomfortably close to home but also kind of safely removed from the politics mm. of today and i really like that she Julia said that people on both sides of the aisle have reached out and and said and, and praised Veep and said that they thought that they were making fun of the other side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the sign of a genius genius show and it has been from day 1. So we're so thrilled that we we finally got to interview somebody from from one of our favorite shows which I feel we feel like we've talked about that from the very first episode of this podcast. Yeah. Um the other show that we mentioned in that first episode I believe was ABC's Blackish. Yeah. Uh, which is one of my favorite comedies. It's sort of my go-to feel-good family sitcom, but it's so much more than that. It's also kind of a brilliant satire of class and race in America today. It's super smart. It's laugh-out-loud funny and often very, very touching. And one of the main reasons that it works so well is Anthony Anderson. My phone is going off. Uh Uh-oh. It's my mother. Let's get her on the podcast. Oh, wait, should I? Oh, I'm going to answer. Are we ready? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Mom. Hi, Mom. How are you? Good. Are you at work, I'm assuming? I'm literally... <laughs> um, guess, yes, I am at work. <laughs> You're literally doing something. I am in the middle of the recording studio, and you, Mom, are on the air. <laughs> oh, hi. We're all over you. <laughs> <laughs> Ma... <Mom. laughs> Is it is the sunrise right now? Yeah, the sun's rising. It's behind me on my commute. She's from Honolulu. Uh, faithful listener, Sherry Smart, is uh, joining us on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should let you go. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, we're so honored to have you. Uh, we're recording uh, intros and outros for Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Anthony Anderson. Uh, my favorite! Two of your favorites. <laughs> <laughs> His timing could not have been better. Um, Even better. Oh and no one could have planned that we had a third guest on this podcast. So thank you for joining us. Well, it's funny because those are like two of the four shows I watch. Right? <laughs> well, see, I'm like, blackish. yeah, I'm like realizing that I made this episode for you. And it's really perfect that you're calling. Really? It's really 50% of my TV watching right there. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, that's, this is so excellent. Um, well... Have a good day. All right. Have a great day. <laughs> okay, you too. Bye. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> so sorry, uh, apologies <laughs> for that. I'm keeping all of that in. I I really think you should. <laughs> it was really. Anyway, let's um back to what I was saying <laughs> before we were most fortuitously interrupted. Anthony Anderson is a a genius, and I kind of I I do admire him a great deal as an actor. And he grounds that show Blackish as a he's a writer and producer on the show, but of course he's the star. He plays Dre Johnson. He's he sets the tone for that show. Um, and he's, as he talked about, it's a character that was a little bit based on him uh, to begin with. But he's just evolved it into this really touching and really heartfelt and just outrageous performance. Yeah, and credit goes to him for a lot of the uh, casting decisions as well. It was uh, That's it right. seems like he was very much involved from day one. That's right. He um, we talked we touched briefly on the casting of Tracy Ellis Ross as Bo, his wife on the show, which we also spoke about with uh, casting director Amanda Linker Doyle in our bonus episode of this podcast. So um, we kind of came full circle on that one, I suppose. So let's get to our interview first with uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus. Quick note to listeners: the audio on this interview, uh, Julia joined us over the phone, so the audio is occasionally a little bit wonky, but otherwise. Her wisdom is uh, as clear as day. Yeah. Actors are going to want to hear this one. So let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsors. We love you, HBO. We do. And uh, get to our interviews with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Anthony Anderson. This episode is brought to you by HBO's original limited series, Big Little Lies. Told through the eyes of three mothers, Big Little Lies paints a picture of a town fueled by rumors, conflicts, secrets, and betrayals. Vanity Fair raves. The performances are downright mesmerizing. For your Emmy consideration, an outstanding limited series and all other categories. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is a legend of TV comedy. She has nine Emmy Awards, seven for acting, and two for producing with a total of 23 nominations. She's received Golden Globes, SAG Awards, Critics' Choice Television Awards, and more for her roles as Elaine in Seinfeld, Christine in The New Adventures of Old Christine, and Selena Meyer in the HBO comedy Veep. Thank you for joining us, Madam President. Here it is, our interview with Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Hi, I'm so good. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on Backstage's podcast. Did you were you ever familiar with Backstage? Did you ever use us in your early acting days in New York? Or um, I probably did, but it was like 105 years ago, so <laughs> hard for my memory. Uh huh. <laughs> but I've done interviews and stuff with you guys in the past, right? And you've always been very nice and lovely. I'm such a huge fan, and I'm such a huge fan of Veep, especially Veep season six, which was just amazing. And you said Thank in an you. interview that politics and acting are sort of similar because they're both approval based and like me, like me, like me. And so I'm wondering if you yeah. kind of drew from the life of a of a working actor. Does that inform Selena Meyer at all? You bet it does. I mean, I think the idea of staying relevant and uh, selling yourself kind of as a, shall we say, a brand, or you're sort of selling an idea of what you are to the public. I mean, those parallels are, are, are very relevant Mm -hmm. and also trying to sort of stay in the game. I mean, politicians are constant, you know, even, you know, I was very struck by in, in uh, Congress, if you're elected as a Congress person, as soon as you're elected, you have to start. Uh, you have to start running again. Yeah, yeah. And to a certain extent, you could say the same um, as an actor. You know, you get a job, but then you're constantly thinking about what's my next job going to be, mm-hmm. and how, and can I get another job after this job? You're constantly trying to stay kind of alive in the game. And uh, so there's there's a lot of similarity, I think, and also, you know, as a as a woman, you know, right, a woman who, I mean, I've been doing this now for 
you know, I've, I mean, professionally, I've been doing it for, I don't even know how long now, I guess 35 years. I don't even know. But, sure. you know, as you, as a woman who's getting older, that is also <laughs> a, uh, there, there are parallels there as well. Maybe, maybe, although I'm actually, as I say that, I'm also wondering because, in Washington, maybe it gives you a kind of gravitas to be older. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I believe that exactly. But right. It's, as a woman, I'm not sure. I don't know. But anyway, all of it, all of it is the, the parallels run deep. So the most important goal is to make people laugh, of course. But in addition, there's the satire element of deep. Like, how is there a list of other priorities and is satirizing current events and maybe even the current political climate, like, is that on the list of things that you think about? No. Um, we, we are a, uh, I would say we are, we are certainly a political satire, but we're not a parody of the current situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, frankly, we couldn't compete with what's going on right now, number one. Right. And number two, we've set this up in such a way so that we've created an alternate universe. Right. It's like, after... I would say after the Reagan presidency, Mm. uh, there are no, we do not allude to any other real political uh, leaders in in our history. And it's like the world shifted Mm -hmm. and sort of uh, the, the universe shifted at that point in our deep world so that, you know, it was President Stevens. And Pres Stevenson and President Hughes, and mm-hmm. we created this alternate universe. And in fact, we don't even identify party. We just say our party, which I think has right. been a huge benefit, particularly now because <laughs> everything is so polarized right now. I think the beauty of it is that it allows everybody to come to the party, shall we say, mm-hmm. and feel as if they're included and are able to laugh. And the truth is, we've had both sides of the aisle. First of all, we consult with both sides of the aisle, um, Mm. and we have for years. uh, And we have Republicans and Democrats um, uh, uh, as consultants. You know, people from the Bush administration, people from the Obama administration Mm. have been consultants on our show. Um, And I was just speaking... For my own experience, I've had people from both sides of the aisle come and tell me how funny they think it mm-hmm. is, and they often think we're making fun of the other side, which is hilarious. Oh, that is so hilarious, yeah. I'm the, so, so, yeah, mission accomplished, as, right. as far as I'm concerned, in terms of that, yeah. And, and by the way, I have nothing against political parody. I mean, I'm right. all for it, and I think it's wonderful, and SNL does it brilliantly, and as do so many others, but I just... That's not what this show's about. Right. And so and so take us back. The very first time you heard about Selena or read the read a script, like how involved were you in that process? And did you ask, is this parody or is this satire? And like what kind of influences did you have in creating the character? Or was the goal always just be funny? Well, the funny thing is that's the undercurrent of all of this. But the... Um, mm-hmm. I heard about this show when it was in development at HBO. Um, my my um, agent told me they're developing a show about a female, uh, a very unhappy female vice president. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, that's all I needed to know. I was immediately intrigued and <sighs> wanted to get in on this action. Um, and then I found out that Armando Iannucci was mm-hmm. writing it and developing it. And I was a huge fan of his. Uh, having seen uh, his movie um, In the Loop. And so mm-hmm. I I met with Armando, which was, like I say, not written yet. And we met for, you know, what was meant to be a 45-minute coffee, and we sat there for two and a half hours mm-hmm. talking about the character. And I was talking to him about my experience just as a, as a citizen getting out there and, you know, uh, helping out campaigns and my involvement in politics, you know, mm. from the sort of sidelines, but what I've experienced. And we were sort of talking about that and, and political behavior and blah, 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 blah. And so I, I would say I was very involved from the very beginning, and then the script came through, and it was 
pretty awesome, and, and you know, we all we worked on it more, and we cast it. So, I mean, I, I was I was involved from the beginning, right. I would say. And um, what was so wonderful about working with Armando was that he's incredibly collaborative. He loves actors. He really does. Mm-hmm. And so anything that an actor uh, brings, he's always open to hearing and incorporating into the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we got along really well. It was, it was a nice collaboration. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and I'm always curious about the, especially for TV shows that are comedies, sometimes it really feels like a show has to kind of get into the rhythm of, like, finding which jokes land and which rhythms work. And Veep, to my eyes, was its masterpiece from the beginning. (laughs) And I'm wondering, was there a point early in season one or even before you started filming that you kind of understood, oh, this is what this show is, this is who Selena is, this is what we're doing? Yeah, I think I I understood it in the pilot, yeah. Oh, and I wonderful. could tell because I knew, I, I mean, I, I understood the, the naturalistic approach to the, to the dialogue, the overlapping dialogue, the idea that jokes uh, shouldn't seem performed. Mm, yeah. Um, that it needed to be, it, it had a kind of, um, there was sort of a very fly-on-the-wall quality to the, from an audience point of view, to these performances, it, it had to feel unperformed. It had to feel like right. life, the way we're talking over one another in this conversation. It had to have that quality to it. And it had to have it, and that it's the denseness. So mm. um, there was a denseness to the dialogue. Mm-hmm. So that it, it, very often, you know, I hear that people need to watch it more than once to hear it all. Sure. And, um, and to get it all, and that was, I think, in place from the from the get go. Well, and you've done so many TV shows. Is it true that that's just really rare? That it's from the from the pilot, everything was sort of in sync. Um. Yes, I would say that is rare, actually. And it doesn't mean it doesn't evolve from that moment. I mean, right. you're playing a character, or as, as all the actors are playing these characters now for. Well, we're going <laughs> heading into our seventh year, which is yeah, wow. astounding. But at any rate, you're, you're playing those characters, you know, uh, stuff, like I say, evolves and yeah. deepens and thickens. It's like a sauce that you keep simmering and it sort of, you know, it, it uh, um, reduces and then mm. you add more things to it and it bubbles up again. And it's sort of the <laughs> same notion uh, over a long period of time with, with characters. And, of course, we've added regular characters to the show since right. uh, the show's inception, which has been um, a treasure as well. But um, but I think everybody, there was a lot of, and, and I, re- I believe the reason for this, the, the, the fact of our show being in place sort of from the beginning is because we had an enormous amount of rehearsal. Mm. And <clears throat> any actor will obviously say that, you know, there, the, the benefit to that is, big and deep and mm-hmm. um and we ben- we did, did benefit from that we had weeks of rehearsal uh on a pilot wow yeah. imagine is there a lot of rehearsal before every episode now there's less rehearsal than there was back in the day okay. but i think that uh, but there is rehearsal <clears throat> uh particularly for big scenes that need it ah. um and so we we'll, we will set aside a couple of days or a few hours before, you know, depend. it really depends on the show, mm-hmm. not speaking for what we do now. I think uh, rehearsal is obviously always beneficial, but in the beginning, we certainly needed it more than we need it now. We still need yep. it, but we don't need it as uh, regularly. Right. Well, and I love that idea of the, of, the, of the process being a process of reduction, of kind of sitting in the stew of that. And I'm always yeah. curious, and I think working actors are curious, how much of that has to do with improv? Because obviously a lot of these, a lot of those lines and a lot of those moments are impro- improvised, especially the, those really amazing reaction shots that you and Tony Hale especially have. And so how much of that happens on set and how many different, how different are the takes for one thing? Takes can be radically different for one to the next. Wow. And all of the actors on the show, without exception, are improvisers. So I would say our, those skills are being utilized in every scene. Now, that doesn't, I'm not saying that the scenes aren't written, right. but 
Um, I also, but we are sort of we're locked arm in arm with our writers so that we can we will we work to, in concert with them to sort of shall we say you know I don't know transition things mm-hmm. or you know discover stuff on set very often and you just fold it in it just gets folded in mm-hmm. and uh, and that's through improvisation it's through blocking it's through mm. I mean, we've got writers who are huddled around the, in, in the monitor in Video Village. People are, it's, it's a moving target, I will say. Wow. The story's in place, but, the, but the, the actual, the execution of the show is an absolute moving tar- target and very organic. Wow. Um, yeah. And so the scripts are completely solid, and then they get heaped on to more stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so... That's how it works. And is it true also that each episode, like its original runtime is twice the length of the episode and you then got to trim, trim, trim that denseness that you're talking about means that a lot has to be edited out, right? Yes. The job of our editors Mm. is um, (laughs) enormous. Sure. And uh, we have uh, a lot of material that doesn't make the cut a lot. (laughs) Is that hard (laughs) to see those? Great, that yes. great material go, yeah. Yes, and sometimes if it's really great, we'll hang on to it and hmm. uh, re reuse it, reboot it in in another episode. Oh, know? cool, right? Uh, That's interesting. Yeah, and so how much of that too is your role as producer? Are you involved in the editing process? I am. Yes, cool. I am. And so there's, you know, there's a lot. I mean, I feels like it's a job that never ends, but fortunately it's a job I love with my heart and soul. Hmm. So I have the energy for it, but yeah, I am involved in the editing. So, um, and, uh, and I love it. Right. And because you're there on camera and you, because you're the biggest character on the show, like you know what works and what doesn't, and you know, which of those scenes are, Oh, we have to keep this one. Oh, let's try to save that and repurpose it for later. Like you're helping make those decisions. Correct. I am. Sometimes, you know, I i mean, Dave Mandel and I are very much in simpatico and cahoots with all of this. Now, Dave is our new showrunner and has been on board now right. uh, for two years. And, and uh, he and I see very much eye to eye. And, and if we don't, we'll sort of find a way to work it out. And that's been a great thing. Uh, but, so, you know, sometimes things aren't super duper clear or maybe you get... Mar- you're married to it until you see it on screen mm. and like, Oh no, I guess that did work. Or, you know, or if it, if you're not sure, you know, there's certainly a lot of people I trust on the show and you, you pull them in to get their opinion, you know? Right. So, so there, so it sounds like there's a lot of watching your own work. Or do you watch the dailies? Is- you know, I used to, I don't anymore. Oh, okay. I used to watch the dailies like a uh, crazy person, uh-huh. but I don't know. I, I, after a while, it got to, first of all, it was too time, and uh, it, it took too much time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, if you're working a 15-hour day, to spend another hour and a half watching dailies is not necessarily useful. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I will go and watch dailies if I'm worried about something not working, hmm. or I want to see the look or whatever it is. But what I will do is I'll just go to, I'll watch playback um, uh in Video Village, um, mm-hmm. and that usually gives me a sense of, of how we're doing. And when you do that, is that a, a question of, like, switching hats from actor to producer? Or are you still kind of assessing that as an actor? Are you being critical of yourself as a performer? Uh, uh, both, yeah, uh-huh. both. Because you can't help but criti- I mean, but to assess your own performance, right? Oh, yeah, you, I mean, you have to. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And if you're not sure about something, you know, I'll, I'll go and watch it and... Uh, walk away with, with uh, self-loathing and shame. This is awful. <laughs> and, uh, and attack it again, you know? <laughs> wow. And so, and have there been times when you have to kind of put more of the producer hat on and say, well, that acting choice or that performance, I'm not totally happy with it, but you know, as a producer, we got to make this show and we got to make it happen. We got to make it work. Yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah. Definitely. That's tough. Then you make adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's Okay. I don't mind it. I mean, I like uh, I, I, I like wearing both hats. Um, mm-hmm. 
at, at this stage of the game. I find it very useful. Um, I feel very protective of our little show. I think I, I guard it fiercely, and mm. and um, and so that that helps me guard it. You know, mm. um, I'm very proud of what we've done, and I want to keep up this the keep this good thing going. And and uh, if I weren't producing it, I would I would feel more. You know, I I, I just have to. Absolutely. Also, at this point in my life, I mean, I have a lot of experience doing this, and so it's good to bring that to the table. Yeah. Well, and I want to get into that experience because um, we here at Backstage, of course, we love kind of hearing about the first steps of an actor's career and kind of uh-huh. where you were and what you were thinking. I mean, you were one of the youngest new people to join SNL. What, what was that process like? I mean, what do you remember about, first of all, what training got you there, got you to that opportunity? Um, well, I was at Northwestern University and I had worked for a brief period of time with Second City. But primarily I worked uh, outside, in addition to going to school, I did work with the practical Kiwido company in Chicago. Mm. And um, and it was that work and my the the work that I did at Northwestern that was very informative to me and and and, and sort of what was sort of I don't know, the building blocks of my life mm-hmm. and in many ways, on many different levels, including the Friendship and mm. um, and it's how I met my husband, then boyfriend, now husband. But I was doing a show in Chicago between my junior and senior year of college. I was doing a, a pretty popular show in Chicago, mm-hmm. with practical theater, and um, the producers of SNL came and saw it, and they offered us a job. Uh, on SNL right after having seen the show. Wow. Um, and off we went uh, to go do Saturday Night Live in, um, in New York. So um, that's how that, that's how that did happen. It was, it sort of, it just sort of fell upon me. Right. And, and that was the dream, right? I mean, you said, of course, that it was, people say being on that show is insanely difficult, but it, was that a goal of yours from the beginning of, of, from that first moment of, oh, I want to be an actor. I want to be a comedian. No, I wanted to be an actor. Uh, I didn't ever think about being necessarily in comedy. Gotcha. Um, I just wanted to act, um, and I wanted to do comedy and drama. I, it, it turns out the gigs I've gotten have been mainly comedic, hmm. um, but uh, but I've, I've, I've got, I, I, th- I can, I'm ready to do either. When did you know? When and how did you know that, Acting was the thing. I don't remember not knowing. <laughs> cool. I always wanted to do it. Really, I, I did. I don't. There wasn't like a light bulb moment for me. It was mm-hmm. simply just this is what I had to do from the earliest age. I was, you know, putting on shows and things for my parents mm-hmm. and trying to charge them money to come to their to their basement to see the show I was putting on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I just always loved to do it. Amazing. Well, and I, I'm always curious, too, about the, for those of you who get your start on Saturday Night Live, I mean, sketch comedy, how important is the sketch comedy and the writing process on that show? Like, is that an integral part of who you are as an actor? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I grew up a lot doing that show. I mean, it wasn't a very... Hmm. Um, it wasn't a warm environment, and it was very cutthroat. And mm. when I was on it, and not female friendly at all, um, mm-hmm. pretty dog eat dog. So I certainly learned um, learned a great deal those three years that I was on. I, I think, really, for me as an actor, the the most useful skill has been the ability to improvise um, right. in a moment. Um, and because, but I, I would think whether you're a dramatic actor or, I, I think most good actors can just do that. I mean, they do that naturally. Right. right. Whether you take an improv class or not, it's just something you have to be able to, you know, if you're inhabiting a character, you are able to sort of go off the rails a little bit with the character mm. if, you, if you've got it, uh, a, a real sense of who it is you're playing. Maybe off the rails is the, the term to use, but you know you can sort of uh, go beyond the border 
and and hopefully you're playing with people who can mm. do that with you, you know, back and forth. Um, that's a very exciting undertaking mm-hmm. with other actors, I think, anyway. Right. But, he, but the, the experience of working on SNL, I mean, it was, in many ways, it was kind of heartbreaking, but I think also that's mm. kind of a good thing. It was it was difficult, and I had to grow up a lot and and figure out what my priorities were at a pretty young age, and so that that was helpful. Right. It informed more of who you are as a person rather than who you are as a comedian or as a... Well, it, it informed who I am as an actor, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. And after I did that gig, I thought to myself, well, if it's all going to be like that. Um, <laughs> that. You know, it was very heavy, drug-heavy, a lot of... Um, people doing pretty serious drugs and stuff like that. It was, mm. it was just like a, a, a bummer in a lot of ways. And I, I thought to myself, is it going to be like this? I'm not interested. I'm really only interested in doing things that are going to make me, that are going to be a good time and are going to make me happy. And as simplistic as that sounds, it's not an easy, and I've just sort of applied it moving forward. Uh, you know, I won't, tolerate assholes and I want to have a good time and every, we're all here to play and support one another. I love ensemble work. I love it. And, um, and I consider myself a member of this ensemble on deep and, right. and I think everybody does, everybody else does. And, and, it, and it sort of goes beyond the actors too. I mean, the writers, we are all, really working hard towards a common goal. And when all those cylinders are firing, it just doesn't get any better than that. It's a deeply joyful experience. And how great that you had that notion of, I hope that the rest of the industry and I hope the rest of my career is not like that experience. And then correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't. It, you did tons of TV and tons of it pilots and, and it was very rewarding, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm not complaining. No. <laughs> I'm doing the I'm I'm doing the opposite of complaining. Right. What does that mean? Yeah, I'm jumping for joy. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> and of course, it was yeah. through SNL that you met Larry David. That's right. Yeah, he was there my third year. Uh huh. There. Yeah. And we were both miserable together, <laughs> and so that was uh, a very bonding experience. And so you so, start on his show about people being miserable together. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Julia, what yes. is uh, your number one piece of acting advice? I think that uh, young or early career actors who are, you know, hitting the streets, going to auditions all the time, mm. they would want to hear mm. from you. Uh, <laughs> what would it be? I would say, <laughs> in the words of my physics teacher, Mr. Coyne, <laughs> okay. I would say, have fun at all costs. Mm. It, as difficult as this business is, try to find your way to have fun despite the challenges, and that might mean working with people you really like, mm. creating your own work, um, but it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I think Actors, oh, it's my actors everywhere will really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us, and so. have fun at all costs. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm trying to do that. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thanks for including me on your show. Thank you. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by HBO's original comedy series, Veep. Veep follows former vice president and one-time president Selena Meyer and her staff as they attempt to make their mark and leave a lasting legacy without getting tripped up in the day-to-day political games that define Washington. Vulture raves, every member of the ensemble cast is still performing at his or her peak. And IndieWire states, Julia Louis-Dreyfus continues to slay. For your any consideration in outstanding comedy series and all other categories. One of TV's funniest performers, Anthony Anderson, is the star and executive producer of ABC's Blackish, for which he is nominated his third consecutive Emmy Award for leading actor in a comedy. He got his start in Compton, California, with the help of his working actor mom. He is a fountain of wisdom for working actors and aspiring comedians everywhere. Here it is, our interview with Anthony Anderson. Yeah. 
you're filming season four. Season four, yeah, day uh, day three of uh, episode number one, season four. Oh, cool, episode number one. Okay, wow. Of season four, yeah, it was 24, 48, 72. This is our 73rd episode. Wow. Yeah, 73rd episode. And so you're, uh, is it safe to say you're quote-unquote campaigning for an Emmy Award at the same time filming the next season of the show? Yeah. I don't think my publicist would like me to say that I'm campaigning for an Emmy Award. <laughs> um, I think she would want me to say it's an honor to be nominated. <laughs> yes. And yeah. um, Anthony, please do this interview with humility. <laughs> uh, no. Um, you know, I'm, I'm making my rounds. It's you know, your, I'm, I'm doing yeah. what's asked of me. Right. Uh, but you know, on a, yeah. On, on a serious note, it is um, it is humbling. You know, this yeah. is this is my third Emmy nomination in a row, um, and it's a it's a pretty humbling experience growing up in Compton, California. Man, just a, a kid with a dream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at nine years old, I said I wanted to be a lawyer, <laughs> play football for the. Uh, Dallas Cowboys or be an actor and and at nine I realized that if I became an actor I could be all three of those things yes and, yes excuse me and whatever else I wanted to become in you life could still do the other two things now you could yeah. start that now I can do that but you're right that as an actor you can totally yeah you know it's crazy my, my mom is uh this is gonna sound horrible but she's a failed actress okay no that's great yeah because actually, she's a horrible actress <laughs> And she'll okay. tell you that. Uh-huh. And, you, and if she, she said, why are you so bad? She said, because I gave all my motherfucking talent to him. <laughs> um, but it's um, it's pretty cool because... It's something that she admits. That yeah, she, no, she admits it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, yeah she, she knows she's bad. Huh. Um, she's, uh, you know, but it's crazy. When I was nine and I had this epiphany that this is what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Uh-huh. And this is what I believe my energy was created and put on this earth to do was to entertain and to share this gift. I don't mm. call it a talent. I call it a gift. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's my responsibility to share that gift with as many people as I possibly can. Excellent. And at the age of nine, I was in the back of the Compton Community College Theater with my two brothers. I'm the oldest. And my mother was on stage uh, rehearsing um, A Raisin in the Sun. Oh. And I just happened to look up on stage at her rehearse and instantly I said, that is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Mm. And you know, it never happened for my mother. You know, we joke about it. We have fun. Um, but, you know, she put her dreams or deferred her dream of being an actor on hold. Yeah. Um, uh, put that, d- put dream that dream on hold to. Uh, yeah, exactly. Raising Mason, the raising the, come on, brother. <laughs> and uh, to raise an actor. You know, yeah. and, and now she I'm did in give a, her, all her yeah, talent and, and yeah. now I'm in a position to help her as an actor. You know, I've, I've uh-huh. you know, had her on Blackish. I've had her in a few of my other productions. And, you know, now she's my co-host on this, on our third season of uh, uh, of our, our, our game show, To Tell the Truth. So, you uh-huh. know, it all comes full circle. So, yeah. you know, to uh, to have the career that I've had to this point and uh, to, to be nominated uh, for another Emmy is, is truly uh, a humbling experience, you know, coming Excellent. from where I come from. Three in a row. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like a third go around with the press and with the promotion and with the mm-hmm. and you've had to also do the filming overlapping with that or filming uh, filming, filming overlapping the, with what the new season of Blackish Wild Camp like while oh yeah we we just started we just started right. uh, Monday Monday was our first day back uh, for our uh, fourth season and um, you know every everything is happening at once I'm so excited you have a baby. There's a baby. Yeah, the baby Devante. In the new season. Baby Devante, who's who's precious. He and his twin brother. Mm. Their their names are Berlin and August. Oh cute. Yeah, yeah, they're adorable. Oh, baby actors. How mm. <laughs> what is your advice for baby actors? Um you know what? Renegotiate as soon as you can, babies. <laughs> we need you. Excellent. Oh. Excellent. Um, I do. I want to ask about. I want to go back to the failed. The failed actor. Thing. Go back to it. It's not something that we. I think at backstage talk about very often because we're focused on the success. We're focused right. on the getting there <laughs> mm-hmm. and getting that big break. And and you, I, you know what does being a failed actor entail? Does that is that finding an inner peace with yourself and with that or? Um. I wish my mother was here so she could tell you that. I, I mean, you know, my mo- my mother was, this is all she wanted to do, man. Growing up in, in Chicago, the south side of Chicago, and then moving uh, to Watts, California with my grandmother when, when, when she was, you know, young. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, growing up, you know, in plays, um, growing up. It's a funny, funny story. As I was growing up in Compton, watching television, my mother would be, oh, I'm in this movie. I'm in this movie. Here I come. And um, he would go, here I come. Watch for me. Watch for me. There I go. <laughs> and we look and say, Mama, I didn't see you. I didn't see you. And my mother, that's me, that's me in the yellow dress. My mother was an extra in yeah, uh, like yeah. Three the Hard Way in a crowd scene of like 250 people. Uh-huh. But that was her claim to fame. Sure. And but she's uh, proud of it. No, no, she is. Yeah. She is. Uh, and so are you. But, um, but yeah, you know, she, like, like I say, you know, it sounds horrible when, when I say that about my mom. But, you know, we joke about it and she, and she knows yeah. it. And yeah. I shouldn't say she knows it. She, she knows that, you know, it, her dream was a long shot. Um, sure. And um, but we laugh now. We we laugh. And it always now. is a long shot. Yeah, I mean, you know, for for every one of the stars in the yeah. sky, for every one of the successes that you have, there are ten thousand people who are out there trying to get, you know, that big break, that that one yeah. break, trying to get that shot, you know. And I can honestly say that I'm one of the blessed and fortunate ones mm. um, to be able to live my dream every day. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't call this work. This is, this is my dream that I've made into a reality, and so I get to play every day, and I get to play with some of the most amazing actors in the world, you know. Um, And it's, it's, it's a humbling experience, man. And 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 you know, sometimes I pinch myself because of. Mm who I know, who I'm able to work with, who I call my friends and and what I'm able to do. Yeah. 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 You know, I because I have I have several friends who are much more talented talented than than I am who are still trying to get that shot. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the thing? You know, and, and it's there's there's no rhyme or reason as to, you know, why success happens for one and it doesn't happen for the other. Right. You know, um well, Th- and that's why I say I'm fortunate. Yeah, well, and, and having said, even though there's no rhyme or reason, like, let's break it down. Like, how do you get that big break? Like, how do you go from um, talented to talented and successful? You know, uh, it was something that I learned or, or heard a long time ago. Um, you know, you have to be ready for when that window of opportunity presents itself. You know, um, mm-hmm. And you have to work on yourself and work at your craft in the meantime, because we're all going to get that window of opportunity. Mm. Uh, we have no idea when that window of opportunity is going to present itself. Yeah. So you have to stay ready. Interesting. Yeah. Um, because you can't waste time getting ready because we don't know how long that window of opportunity will be there. So when that mm. window of opportunity does present itself, if you're ready, you jump through it and you break through it. Yeah. Like um, you can't control when the window appears. No, you can't. And and you know what? Um, you can't will it any sooner than what is destined either. Right. And that's something that I tell young actors and I just tell people, you know, you can't will it any sooner than what it's destined. The only part of the equation that you can control is you. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to be the best at whatever it is that you can do, be the, do the best to your ability. And, and when that opportunity presents itself... You're ready. You also, I want to ask about your early stand-up because you, correct me if I'm wrong, you experimented with stand-up comedy and yes. largely were not pleased with the results or with that path. Um, it must inform what you do now. So you want to bring up that, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. Speaking you know, of failed. <laughs> oh, you're speaking of failures. Let's let's talk about that. Um, no, I because um, you're. I mean, you're such a natural comedian, and yeah. I would. I'm surprised to, to hear that stand up wouldn't fit you. No, it it it, it does. It didn't fit early on. Okay. And yeah. and because it was early on. Yeah, it was early on, and I was. I, I went to this place called the Comedy Act Theater off of Crenshaw. And it's where all of the comics of my generation and slightly before the Robin Harris's, the Martin Lawrence's, the Eddie Murphy's mm-hmm. and, and all these guys, this is where they, they came and, and uh, cut their teeth, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak, in Los Angeles. And so you hear about this place and it's, it's hallowed ground. So I was sure. like, all right. So they had open mic night. Oh, okay. So I went down That's to so open. That's so scary. Yeah, so I went down to open mic night one week and I had a bunch of my buddies with me. 
And, uh, you know, you have to get there early, put your name on the list, and then they'll go through the list and call you up. Well, there were so many people there that, you know, by the time I got there, I was near the bottom of the list. Uh, so, you know, they only gave us a certain amount of time in, in the room before the headliners would come through. So I didn't uh, make it. I didn't I make see. the cut that, that week. And gotcha. so the next week I went back, but none of my friends or my support group could make it with me. The second time around. The second time oh, okay. around. So I was like, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm not here to do this for them. I'm here to do this for me. Okay. So let me go do this. Yeah. So I went down there by myself, got there early enough to sign the list. Uh -huh. I was the third comic that they called, but I was dealing with my own insecurities. Am I going sure. to be funny? You know, am I going to be witty? Are of they going to get this? So the first two comics who got up ahead of me, and we're all amateurs, mm -hmm. they were horrible. Okay, yes. And I heckled them because I was dealing oh. with my own insecurities. Yeah. And huh. I was hilarious as a heckler. <laughs> oh, okay. I killed as a heckler. <laughs> And I got some of the biggest laughs I have ever gotten, ever, as a heckler. As a heckler. Oh. And on one of these big laughs, and then another thing that didn't help me was my name. Um, How so? I'll tell you. Uh, and another thing, <laughs> and, and so as a heckler, I was hysterical, got this laugh, and the guy just happened to call my name, and it was like, Tasty Tony, <laughs> the one and only, if there's another, he's a phony. <laughs> okay. Oh Come God. up. And so I sat there and I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, I don't need to get up. I got my laughs. And I was like, no, but you came here to tell jokes. Right. You came here to be witty. Get up and go up there. And so I got up and well, I'm in a room full of comics. Yeah. And nobody knew who I was. Sure. And so they saw that it was me, the heckler. Yeah. And they were like, oh, oh, mother. You better be funny. Uh-huh. Oh, you were talking all that shit. You better make me laugh. So I'm getting crucified as I walk towards the stage. It's like the, the definition stage. of a tough crowd. It's yes. the toughest crowd. As I yeah. get on the stage, I, I get my mic. Everybody starts going in at me. Ooh. You know, I'm not even on stage 10 seconds. Uh -huh. They turn my mic off. <gasps> Oh. Because they know I'm not going to be able to get through anything because of how I'm being crucified. And rightfully so. Oh, my gosh. And so I dropped the mic and I was like, I don't need a mic. Oh. I don't need this mic. <laughs> Five seconds later, they shut my spotlight off. Oh, wow. So now I'm on stage with no mic, no amplification, and in total darkness. This is just trial by fire. And, like. oh, my God. And I turn and I walk off the stage oh. humiliated. I get into the bathroom and I'm literally sh oh, shaking yeah. and trembling because even though I had never done anything professionally to, to that point, hmm. this was still my dream. This was still my craft so, as an so, entertainer. Sort of debut, yeah. And I have never failed at it like this. Yeah. And I, I'll never forget Guy Torrey, who's a great comic and a great friend now. Hmm. Uh, had no idea who I was and he was the host for the evening for the main shows he came into the bathroom I just happened to be in there shaking and he saw what happened and he was like hey man it's alright it's alright get back up there Oh, you know get back up there now you know what not to do yeah <laughs> he said and it happens he yeah. said but you'll be alright had no idea who I was yeah and left I'll never forget I got in the car Turned the radio off, rolled the windows down, and uh, so I could get fresh air. And I drove home in tears. Yeah. And um, I mean, everything that could have gone wrong went. Oh, it did went wrong. And fast forward, maybe ten years later, uh, Guy and I are great friends. Cool. And we're filming a movie called Life with Eddie Murphy, uh -huh. Martin Lawrence, oh, Bernie yeah. Mac, Oba Babatunde, Amazing. Barry Shabaka Hindley, Cicely Tyson, and. Uh. I'm working with all of these actors. And Guy and I have never talked about this story before. I've uh, put it out of the recesses of my mind. Uh -huh. And we're sitting in um, at lunch one day, and I was like, and it just hit me. I'm looking yeah. at everybody that I'm working with, and that story hit me. And I was like, Guy, hey, man, do you remember when you used to MC at the Comedy Act Theater? And he was like, yeah. I said, do you remember a night when a dude got up 
and bombed. <laughs> and you walked in the bathroom and saw him shaking and wow. trembling and looking at himself in the mirror. He said, yeah, man, I remember that. I was like, dog, that was me. That was me. <laughs> Had no and he didn't idea. Know. No. Had no idea. And we sat and we talked about it. And he was like, yo, aunt, look at you now. He said, I remember. I told you to get That's back right. up. I said, yeah, you told me to get back up. Yeah. And um, I never did get back up. I didn't get back on the mic. <laughs> I didn't get back on the mic um, for about four years. And I just happened to be at a nightclub in Hollywood. It was my birthday. And for some reason at midnight, oh. the restaurant slash club slash bar that we were in turned into open mic. My buddy comes oh, over God. and gives me two Heinekens. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, he said, happy birthday. I said, thanks, man. He said, oh, this isn't for your birthday. This is to get you ready because I just signed you up oh, to do okay. uh, open mic. <laughs> birthday stand up. Yeah. And um, I got on stage. Yeah. What would you do? And I had no idea. It was It was all... It was all improv, and it was, you know, I come from the theater, so I could improv, I could work sure. anything like that. And it was, I, I, I do remember laying on the stage at one point on the back <laughs> after getting a nice laugh and was like, this is so therapeutic uh, cool. for me. Okay. You have no idea where I came from to get to this place. Yeah. And um, less traumatizing. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and now, you know, I go out. And I host comedy shows, you know, throughout the right. year when I have the time. Like, like it was like, yeah, I was, I was built for this. This is what I was meant to do. Amazing. But, uh, but yeah, no, no, no. Uh, so yeah, that was that, that was that was an interesting story. You, you bring up stand up, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be the stand up. Even just a night of horrible, traumatizing, horrific stand up. That's got to be one of the ingredients it is. of who you are as a performer. Right? Oh, you, yeah, you, you know, you have to. You have to be able to sit in that pocket. You have to take the good mm. with the bad. Yeah. You know, just just as yes. we are as actors, if you're going to believe the good reviews, you have to believe the bad reviews when they when they write about them as well. Do you read reviews? I, not not really, but you know, uh, sometimes when um, you know my publicists or, or friends send them to me, I was like, okay, cool. Well, where are the bad ones? <laughs> right. They're all not good. Because I think that's true. You can't just yeah. If you just read the good ones, you're just lying to yourself. Yeah, exactly. I was like, no, I, I want to I want to hear the negative. Shit. I, I just I just want to I want to because I take it as I, that's what I was just right. about to say I take it as constructive criticism yeah I was like let me look at it I want to see it just don't send me the good shit um, yeah and yeah no it's 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 pretty cool I mean you know I'm not one of those guys like ah f them it's like oh they have a point I could have sure yeah you yeah, know yeah, I was yeah. like okay I never thought about it this way but that's interesting. Okay. And do you doubt, do, how often do you go back into your own performances, like maybe right at, like maybe when you're walking away from a set, do you go back and you go, oh, I should have done that different. Oh, I could have played with that more. No. No. I never questioned that. That sounds healthy. I try to be as, as prepared as I possibly can be before sure. I enter the set yeah. or stage, just so I never can say that to myself. Yeah, yeah. If I know I'm prepared when I go into the room or go into a set, I know I can just mm -hmm. lay it all out on the line and nice. I can get direction from whomever. And because I'm so prepared with this, I can go wherever they want me to go. Yeah. It's you know, about and, that and, flexibility. Yeah, and, and I try to tell that to, to my, my son, who, who's a young actor in 17. And, mm. uh, and I was like, son, I was like, I've, I've noticed early on, you know, he would always go into his auditions with, you know, still reading from the page. I was mm. like, son, mm -hmm. Oh. I was like, you can't, you can't do that, man. Yeah. I was like, because the dude before you or after you isn't reading from that page. He's not locked into this. Right. I mm. was like, he, I was like, you don't have the freedom that those other two actors totally have. Yeah. Because you're stuck with this. I was like, you got, you have to prepare for this, man. So that way, when you're mm. given a note or an adjustment, you can just incorporate that to, into what you've been preparing for, and then you can just fly and soar. Right. So that's how I try to prepare for everything that. <laughs> that i do so uh whenever they yell cut and, and that's a wrap for the day i don't second guess myself it's like oh man i should have did that or i should have did that's this. just not part of the work ethic mm -mm. and is that true for blackish because i i'm curious about the prep for any long-running show but mm -hmm. especially for this show where dre is sort of similar i mean he's sort of an alter ego yeah or he was at first i would I oh would. still is yeah 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 and so was the, is there some big lengthy character building process before the pilot of this show no 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 character building i mean dre is 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 me you know it's it's yeah. me and and it's it's kenya you know the mm -hmm. this character is us 
Uh, so no, there, no, there was really no character building. I know this character inside and out. Mm-hmm. I, I live with him. You and know, so you can I focus am, on the like really getting the joke perfectly or getting the serious bit perfectly yeah. and you know yeah. and, and 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 i work with Lawrence fishburne i work yeah. with tracy ellis ross <laughs> i work with jennifer lewis i want to ask about all of them you know and yeah. i work with these children i mean you yeah. know they force me uh you can't slack. Uh, to work no yeah. not at all yeah. and, you know it's crazy i never want to let Lawrence down is you he know? the one? Yeah, he's like the real. Yeah, but 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 he's not even like that. It's just me. <laughs> it's just like I hold him in such regard that totally. whenever I have scenes with Lawrence, yeah. I know my lines frontwards and backwards. Yeah. You know, because I never want to waste his time. Yep. That's how I look at it. I never want to waste his time when he's on set. Um, and, you know, I always tell Tracy, I was like, Tracy, I was never nominated to, for an Emmy until I worked with you. <laughs> That's true. So That's um, true. thank you. You know, um, I like that, that you actors hold each other responsible unless because of they their re- yeah. respect for it, each it, other. Exactly. Yeah. You know, Tracy and I have this pact and it was like, I'll never let you fall. I will Amazing. never let you fall. You know, and if and if you do, I'm falling with you. Uh huh. Uh-huh. You know, uh, we can never be afraid to fall because if we're afraid to fall, we will never take a leap. Sure. You Have know? there been times when you do fall? What does that mean to fall like on while working on this show? Um, we haven't. No, I I think the two of you are just we, we haven't upping and, each other's games every it, episode. Yeah, it is. It is, and and I don't I don't think we ever will because there's such. A respect and there's there's uh for for one another and and we are so protective of one another as characters and as actors and yeah. as friends um yeah i don't i don't i don't think there there's ever been a time where where yeah. she has allowed me to fall or i've allowed her to fall or we we, we even tripped over something you know no. um it's 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 pretty amazing to to say that going into a fourth year of a show yep. uh, with so many moving parts hmm. coming in and out. Um, yeah, it's truly, truly amazing. Well, as a devoted fan, I it doesn't surprise me at all to hear that that pact, hap- I can see that mm-hmm. pact very clearly between the two of you. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm always so curious whenever there's a family on TV and it seems like they are a real family, like even in this sometimes very goofy stakes mm-hmm. of the show, you guys all have chemistry. And, like, how do you define or find chemistry? I mean, I know Tracy kind of came in and auditioned, and you guys were like, she's the one. Yeah. And then the family fell into place. Yeah, well, you know, I got my pick of the litter. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. With Tracy, with Yara, with Miles, with Marseille, and with Marcus. Mm-hmm. These were all my first choices. Amazing. You know, and... um just working with them individually in the producer session before we took them to the studio and it's like yeah this piece is going to work this yeah. piece is going to work this piece is going to work cool. this piece is going to work i can't wait to put all the pieces together yeah. and and that's how it happened we brought everyone's tape to the uh to the studio on the network we didn't tell them who our choices were um, oh, okay and we played the tape and so during the call uh sitting around the desk with everyone um we would say okay who do you think it is? And they would be like, Tracy, good, because that was our choice. Who do you think Take it is? Podcast. Miles, good, that's our choice. Every <laughs> session we went in, they, they told us who they wanted. We were like, great, because that's our choice. And that just makes it seem like fate. It yeah, seems like oh, definitely. And, definitely. And our first episode after the pilot, once we were picked up for series, mm-hmm. halfway through the, not even halfway through the day, I turned to Tracy. We were all a family in the kitchen doing something in the scene. And I was like, I said, Trace, I said, this sounds crazy, but (laughs) it seems as if we've been working together for five years already. Amazing. Just because of how seamless it was with everyone. From episode one. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, from from episode one. And the stars align. Yeah. But like you said, it has a lot to do with the prep and with the amount of work and the work ethic that you bring, that you all bring into it and the respect you have for each other. And that's what Mm -hmm. then gets you to the point of like, chemistry comes from follow chemistry yes. kind of follows that yeah i would say and you know and i try to have a loose set mm-hmm. you know the only requirement we all have is just know your lines <laughs> yeah that's it just, well that helps with the really good lines yeah oh, definitely. really great I mean, writing you know 
<laughs> our writing staff is truly amazing. Absolutely. Um, All of you. Second to none. Yeah. Second to none out there. And I'm, 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 I'm happy for them that the show is finally being recognized, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. apart from these individual recognition. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the show is being recognized, totally. you know best cast you know <laughs> you know best writer best director best show you know th those are the things that that excite me because it's about the collective that makes the individual shine yeah you, you know you and, all deserve it yeah yeah you it's, all it's, deserve it so much yeah. is there any one last piece of advice that you would give early career actor artists writers mm. stand-up comedians <laughs> uh get back up Get back up there. Keep getting back up yeah. there. You know, swing for the fences. And it's okay if you strike out. You get another at bat. Mm -hmm. You know, swing for the fences. Um, you're not going to always hit a home run, but eventually mm -hmm. you'll get on base. Uh-huh. Cool. You know, it's just about advancing the Excellent. ball and getting on base, you know, and, and, and taking it from there. It's okay to hit a single. Uh-huh. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. It's okay to get hit by a pitch. Yeah. You know? You're all right? Okay, get up. Run down the first baseline. Get on base. Actors need to hear that. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's okay. You know? And it's going to hurt sometimes, man. You know, mm -hmm. the ego was going to take, you know, take a hit. But the ego is what got you there. Mm. The ego is what's going to keep you, getting you beyond all of the other sure. stuff. You, no one ever enters anything wanting to be second best. It's like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine with ninth place. Well, right. you know, there are only eight people running. <laughs> oh, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, we always want to believe that we're the best at right. whatever it is that we do. That's, That's really especially as comics. It, nobody sits in the room is like, mm. ah, ha, ha, yeah, I'm going to be <laughs> almost as funny as him. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> No. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's it's, it's the checks ego. and balances, right. you know, and and we have to we have to keep the id and the ego in check. You know, it's about finding mm. that balance, but yeah, you 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 got to brag, you got to <laughs> but but you also have to have something to back it up with. Yep. You know, you just can't be out there selling wolf tickets and be like, "Oh, he all talk, she's all talk." It's like, "No. Nah, let me show you this." Yeah. You know, but but it's just you know, it's just about you know, standing in that batter's box, you know, whatever, and, you know, swinging for the swinging, fences. Swinging, 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 yeah. Eventually, you'll make contact, and when you make contact, run. Excellent. Run down that baseline, you know, and, <laughs> and never accept no, you know, and when the no's happen, mm -hmm. keep going. Yep. We're in the business of hearing no. You know, there are thousands upon thousands of actors out there who want to do what we do. And then you go into this audition and there's 15,000 people reading for this one part. Yep. <laughs> They're going to, they told me no. Look at where I am now. Yeah, yeah. You know, they told everybody before me, everybody with me, everybody after me no. But look at the success that all of these people you admire and look up to have. That we turn mm. the no's mm. into yeses. You know, and, and that's what it is. And, you know, if you don't have, you're not getting the roles that you want or feel nothing is being written for you, mm. create your mm -hmm. own. Totally. Yep. Create your own. That's where the real power is and in intellectual, you know, property. It's like, okay, well, you're not writing this for me. I'm going to write it for myself. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to find some money. I'm going to find somebody who believes in me and believes in this idea. And we're going to make this. Yeah. There's so many outlets now that, that we can go to to have our, our work seen. So, you know, it's, it's about creating these opportunities for yourself, which is, you know, what Kenya and I were doing here with Blackish, mm -hmm. which is what we were doing uh, uh, apart from one another when I created all about the Andersons yep. you know years ago on the WB and and Kenya was off creating other things America's Next Top Model and mm -hmm. other shows and sitcoms and now here we are together with this collective energy and we're here talking and we have blackish yeah that's you because know. there were a lot of no's that yes. kind of paved the way oh exactly we just keep swinging but we can't let the no define who we are no yeah you know because it's just about opportunity it's about perspective. Mm. It's all subjective. 
But never stop believing in who you are. Never stop believing in what you can do. Never stop believing in the possibilities. You know, that that's what I would tell them. That's what I would tell my younger self. Yeah, excellent. You know? That's acting advice gold. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, brother. This is wonderful. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. As Anthony Anderson says, working actors never stop believing in you and in your possibilities. And what a great way to end the season. Indeed. I knew that he would be the perfect end note. He delivered. He totally delivered. Actors, don't give up. If you try stand-up comedy and you fall flat on your face, don't give up. Get back in there. Ugh, what a good inspirational outro for this podcast season. Which brings us to the end of our show, and yeah, brings us to the end of season one of In the Envelope. Well, I have to say it's been a real pleasure working with you on this it podcast. It's an job. honor and a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much for all your work. Likewise. Um, listeners, keep an eye out for season two. The SAG Awards mm. are coming. <laughs> <laughs> SAG nominations are announced on December 13th, and the awards themselves happen on January 21st. Oscar nominations are announced two days later on the 23rd, and the ceremony itself is uh, March 4th. And while we're not promising anything, expect to hear more from the front lines of the awards season races. And we should also thank the listeners of the podcast as well. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for staying tuned and for soaking up the wisdom with us uh, from all of these wonderful Emmy contenders. And I did say in a previous episode that if you do get hugely famous and successful, (laughs) remember us. (laughs) (laughs) If you follow the advice that you've heard here and proceed to get nominated for an Emmy Award, call us. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're next. That's the thing. If you believe in yourself and if you do your training and if you get inspired, the world awaits, listener. That was sufficiently cheesy and vague. So sounds like we should sign off. What better way could we uh, end it with something (laughs) sufficiently cheesy? Sufficiently cheesy is the name of the game. Until next time, listeners, farewell. Goodbye. Thank you to this season's sponsor, HBO. And thank you to all of our Emmy-nominated guests. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe for more in-depth interviews with awards contenders. Special thanks this week to Carson J. Beck and David Godfrey. In the Envelope, an awards podcast is recorded at Lotus Productions and ARS Audio in New York City. Thank you, as always, to Jamie Muffet, producer, editor, and all-around podcast whiz. You can follow him on Twitter at JamieMusicNYC. You can follow me on Twitter at JackSmartWrites. Thank you, of course, to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting, and especially Peter Rapoport, Ryan Rebstad, Jesse Balashak, Francis Ramos, Casey Mink, Rowan al Khatib, and, of course, the incomparable Casey Howe, without which none of this would have been possible. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. <laughs>